Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Max Anderson, Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Founded in 1883, the Indianapolis Museum serves the creative interests of its communities by fostering exploration of art, design, and the natural environment. Over the last 127 years, the IMA has built a solid reputation regionally and in the last decade has increasingly taken a position of national and international prominence as a museum on the leading edge of innovative practice. Director Max Anderson has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Max, for joining us today. Thanks very much, Mark. The Indianapolis Museum has had quite a journey over the last century, and the ongoing transformation has been quite astounding. So let's start off by setting the stage uh, on the, uh, the museum, its collections, and, uh, and then let's talk about, the, talk about today and the, and the future. Now, you joined in, in 2006. What did you find when you came here? I found a place that had a venerable history, as you say, a museum founded in 1883 in that first wave of museum building in the United States that stretched from New York as far west as Chicago and Indianapolis and St. Louis. And what I found was a place that was both venerable and in certain respects worried about taking risks. And part of the pleasure in coming here was tapping into the talent of the staff and the generosity of the patronage here to allow risks to be taken. And I think that there was a receptivity to that in 06, and I think it continues to this day. And the, the museum over the first part of its, uh, of its uh, history actually underwent quite a transformation. The collections today do not reflect necessarily the uh, collections or even the philosophy of, of the museum in its first half century. It was the case with so many great art museums. The Metropolitan Museum started collecting plaster casts in 1870 because they didn't think they could afford to buy the real stuff. And that was the case in many museums, Boston the same year. But I think we were uniquely situated here in a manufacturing center and thought about collecting examples of good industrial design, whether it was textiles or works of any form that were part of daily life. And that's how we began, rather than with plaster casts in the 1880s. And the collection grew, as it so often does in major American museums, through the generous bequests of individuals who had made collecting their passion in their center. And that's how we eventually had the greatest collection of Turner outside of Britain and a phenomenal suite of objects that were part of Carolyn Norman Fessler's role as a trustee and so many other individuals who were integral to the growth of the collection. So yes, like a lot of American museums, it was mapped to individual taste, curatorial acumen, and great generosity. And today, you don't necessarily just rely on your, on your collections. In, in, in visiting the museum over the last three or four months, what's been astounding is the number of different uh, inflection points you bring into your exhibitions and the number of themes that you're able to expose. Right now, there's, there's a Warhol uh, exhibition, which I'm excited to see. Um, but uh, you've also uh, brought in some very kinetic um, uh, pieces, um, uh, rather groundbreaking, um, rather edgy uh, pieces. Could you talk a little bit about your exhibition philosophy, having a collection, but then moving into what some would say would be a very contemporary uh, sensibility? Well, to me, gathering means bringing great artworks to the public in a variety of ways, on loan, as commissioned works, as purchases, as joint acquisitions, as things that may be fleeting and transitory, as experiences that may only last for a season, and not thinking so much as we all have in the past about being bounty hunters who are out to trap this or that object and put it in our cage because there's so many reasons that's no longer practical, whether it's to do with issues of cultural patrimony, statutes, laws, or practices, or the evanescent ways in which artists work today that are not normally mapped to collectibles. And so we think we're a bit more malleable than thinking about collecting in one world and exhibiting in another. We think they are bridged together in, in various ways. And so we're working with the Italian Ministry of Culture to bring a tomb group here from Rome from the first century AD that was discovered in the 1840s and photographed shortly thereafter. So we have contextual information about how these objects looked in the first century AD and how they were seen. 
but working with new technology, we're going to be able to map information about that excavation and succeeding efforts in research to create something that's dynamic and live about works that'll be here for, we hope, a few years, but that's up to the vagaries of the Italian cultural ministry. Is the meaning of the object then in, in the experience of the audience, of the visitor, as opposed to um, looking at the, uh, the object as an object um, simply in and of itself? Yeah, I don't think it's uh, binary. I think there's so many ways to experience artworks through the intention of the artist, through the first context in which it was experienced, through the way in which it entered the market and perhaps entered a private collection or our own collection, and that you can map a variety of interpretive levels to a work of art. Not all of them are equally deserving or interesting. And I think we always want to make room for the, the curatorial voice at any given time in an institution to say, this is what we believe. This is our official word. I guess the distinction is we're not afraid to have other people give their opinions about it and inflect their opinions in a public way on our website. So that, to me, is a different approach to conversing about art instead of interpreting for the benefit of the public that needs it. And it seems that it also blurs the division that so many people make between contemporary museums and art historical museums. It seems that w what you're doing is you're, you're, you're saying, let's bring a, an art historical sensibility to the contemporary and a contemporary sensibility to the historical. Right, well, I mean, all art was contemporary art at one point or another. So the challenge is in figuring out how to keep that excitement and energy around an object from the day of its manufacture to today. And that can involve channeling, as we did with the Sacred Spain exhibition, artistic intention, political wins, religious oppression, conversion efforts, propaganda, and making them feel alive from the 17th century. Figuring out how to match up forms of art that haven't been seen together in hundreds of years and create a hybrid between the old world and the new world because Spain in that time thought of Mexico, Colombia, Peru as new Spain. And so moving past the stereotypes that we anoint with modern day nationhood and looking instead at the intention of the artist, the social context, the practical function of objects, and making sure they feel alive. Is part of, of the function of an art museum to equip people to deal with our changing world as well by looking at, at another example and, and thinking that through and experiencing that in a very personal way? I think so. I think the average uh, day that most people is spent getting up earlier than they should have, driving to work past billboards, working, staring at a screen, driving through a shopping district, maybe getting a meal out and going home and starting it all over again. It's punishing. It's a privation. And being a free art museum, we really just want to be a touchstone for people to, who live here, who visit here to come in and open their eyes and see that whatever their life is can be mapped against other lives that have come before the same year or hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago and have a sense of perspective about the human exchange and dialogue and debate and argument and polemics and passion and not look at the premise that a gold frame picture is what art is or that Art is only valuable if the market says it is, or any of the other things that people may assume when they approach an art museum. We'd like to be disruptive about any of those stereotypical assumptions. The museum, the board, the staff, yourself, have gone beyond that gold frame uh, idea. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, the 100 Acres and, and the, the other, the, the Miller House, and, and, and some of the ways in which you've, you've gone beyond this traditional idea of a museum as a building where gold frame pictures. Yes, we're very interested in how artists are interlocutors and how they can make connections among people and bring us to see the world differently. So the provision of a park right behind the main building, it's 100 acres in size, including a 35 acre lake, is largely a place where artists make works that are interactive, by which I mean touchable, playable, Run, run through them, handle them, and not plinths with Corten steel sitting on them. They are also a playscape for the imagination and for kids and for families to recognize that expressive means today can touch all sorts of media, and they don't need to be limited to what we're accustomed to in the commercial environment, which is what everyone is habituated to.
So between the Master of Adia Isola with that eternal subject and the provision by Atelier von Lieshout of climbable skeleton bones that are picnic tables, they're both, in one way or another, a creative mind taking an opportunity to make something canonical. A skeleton is a very canonical art historical image and create something that was consequential in their own time, but we think we can map to both the present and to the past. And, and seeing the examples of, of artists who do that is, is, uh, is, is very important. Well, there's also a paradox that we live in an age in which instantaneous images fly around and communication is nonstop. And you'd think that would make us more creative because you have access to so much so often. But it can also be suffocating. It can be like a fire hose being open instead of a drinking fountain. And I think an art museum can offer the perspective and context to not withdraw from that, but to participate in that uh, enormous river of information and creativity and be selective about it rather than have it come at you the way television commercials do or pop-up websites do. So we'd love to think of ourselves as a place of respite, but also a place of engagement, curiosity, and energy in the city of Indianapolis. Now, you've had a qu quite an interesting career. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your career trajectory and, and, and how you evolved this, this sensibility that you're uh, helping to Indianapolis to realize? I was a very conventional curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the 1980s. I was very interested in acquiring art, showing it, publishing it, doing exhibitions. And you were a curator of? I was the of Roman in the Department of Greek and Roman Art. So, so I classical was, in the classical sense. Yeah, I was, I was all about the objects made from the third century BC to the third century AD. And other than that, it was wonderful, but I didn't have time for it. So that definitely defined my beginnings. But it was a time of understanding artistic intention at a time when artists no longer were speaking. So that led to my thinking over those years at the Metropolitan that being a director would allow me to move beyond that kind of research and scholarship to a more public role. And I set out to be a museum director, which I started in 1981 uh, as a curator. And I, in 87, became a director at Emory at the museum there and spent eight years at Emory trying to figure out how exhibitions and acquisitions and programs could take one to the kind of currency that we've just been talking about here. This is now your first directorial role. How did you confront that, that task? Because at that point, you get to, to self-define. You don't have a track record as a director. No, and it was, uh, it was very much a terrifying moment to sit behind a desk and think that the small place, as it, at the time it was small, was all up to me to, to govern and guide and direct. And I understood that motivating people was probably the biggest single challenge as a director to get behind ideas and therefore the ideas couldn't just be your own. So I spent a lot of time trying to understand how to draw the energy of a small staff in that case and thinking more about a global stage for art than purely one on a campus. You start to engage in a dialogue using the museum as a platform between a region and the world and the world in a region until the region becomes embraced and embraces that, that broader sense. But you're also dealing with some realities, some economic realities, some limits in what you can do. As you say, you don't have the canvas as, as Philippe de Montebello has. You have, a, you have a smaller canvas, so you have to scale your efforts in, in a particular way. And so you go on from, from uh, there to Ontario, right? Yes. The Art Gallery of Ontario. Well, it was a big jump to go from uh, a museum on a campus to the fifth largest city in North America, I guess, Toronto, and its art museum, and a very important institution for Canadians, but also globally a, an important institution, the greatest Henry Moore collection outside of Britain, phenomenal works of Renaissance and Baroque art all the way through to contemporary art, and a, a museum that was in a city that was very competitive, but being Canadian, didn't want to admit that too loudly. And we did exhibitions with the Courtauld in London and the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and the Hermitage in, in St. Petersburg. And we sought to make the museum more of an international player. And that, I think, was successful. It continues to be today under its current director, Matthew Teitelbaum. And it was a great honor to represent the Canadian people and be part of an international community at that time. 
And then you went to the Whitney. Went to the Whitney in 1998 and spent five years there and had a, an incredible opportunity to work with some of the world's leading artists and think about a museum that was born as an artist's museum, as Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney put it, but really hadn't devoted as much of its energy to being a people's museum, to being open, asserting its position in the city of New York as a player for the cultural community that wanted the public to come and experience the work of contemporary artists. So one form of activity for me there was making the Whitney more relevant for people by putting together a marketing program and in the course of time doubling the attendance to 600,000 Well, it seemed that the people. Whitney at that time, because I was living in New York at that time, it, was, it, it seemed like it was a museum that, that was left a bit behind. Uh, and, and even the surrounding area was, um, was not particularly attractive. It was not particularly a, a great place to, to visit. Well, Madison Avenue has its, uh, has its great strengths. I think it's true our, our brownstones at the time were vacant on the street level, and so we sought to change that. But I think it was also just creating an invitation. There were extraordinary projects and exhibitions that had been going on long before I got there. A there phenomenal was, collection. Uh, yes, and a vital connection to the art world. My move was to start thinking beyond the art world to embrace innovation in ways that weren't familiar to the art world, whether it was bringing Diller and Scafidio there for their first retrospective, during which they got the Lincoln Center gig, or the Quilts of G's Bend, which was not, these were not Quilt makers were not represented in Chelsea and galleries at the time. And so there were some exhibitions and projects we did that were quite experimental and the art world didn't embrace necessarily at first. But what was great was to see the audience grow from say 300 to 600 plus thousand visitors to see the Whitney become one of the four art museums of New York in a way that was truly the case from the public's perspective and to get critical acclaim for a lot of the shows that we did, which were in certain instances pretty traditional and others less so. And I think over that time, we also professionalized a lot of the museum, building a conservation program, overhauling our storage facilities, a very unsexy but important thing yeah. to do, and really thinking about the, the ways in which the museum could, through technology, improve access to the collections, which as you point out were extraordinary, but were not visible in any way. And so putting together all of that was a, a major effort as well. I don't get the sense that you come in um, with kind of full-blown concepts. In, in a sense, it's, it seems to be a journey with you, but it, but it ends up being um, a journey that, that can be followed, particularly in retrospect. About three or four years down the line, you, you get a sense of, of what Max Anderson has has helped and, and how he's collaborated with the community. Well, at the Whitney, the first couple of weeks were very memorable because I had a retreat for the senior staff. At first, I had a board retreat and got their buy-in to a premise that we would have a really open conversation with the staff about our future direction. But what I learned in those first few weeks was the, the real determination of the staff to be taken seriously as professionals and to be seen in an international context as a great museum. So one of our early initiatives was to strike out and acquire a work by Bill Viola jointly with the Tate in London and the Pompidou in Paris to have a three-way acquisition so that all three of us had a third of this as a way of asserting the Whitney's primacy in the United States, acknowledging that a lot of contemporary art is inherently uncollectible, creating a peer status with Tate and Pompidou, and thinking about new models of ownership and collaboration. Now that's interesting. You're looking at this puzzle and you're looking for a solution that achieves multiple objectives simultaneously. It's killing, you know, three birds, four birds with one stone. Well, it was almost impossible because in New York, the territoriality among those museums that work in contemporary and modern contemporary art is impossible. And I think at the moment, Whitney Guggenheim New Museum challenge in New York is a, it's a a soup bowl and very difficult to look for differentiation. The Whitney with its mission around American art was at the time ascendant, trying to think of ways to privilege American artists. I see that beginning to ebb at the Whitney as they strike out in a new direction. For me it was something to hold on to and, and burnish. After that I think you were in LA for a bit, you did a lot of consulting uh, internationally, you were also at Yale, and then you come uh, here to the IMA. The IMA is a completely different type of institution in a different time. And, and meanwhile, technology has, has evolved considerably 
Um, this is one of the few museums where you can actually go to the website and see how much electricity you're using every, every day. You told me that you, ha you have part ownership, segueing to, I think, full ownership of a wind farm. Well, a farm. It's a working farm with soy, corn, and cattle. But it, eventually, maybe it'll be a farm that produces energy <laughs> and not just methane. But I, I think inheriting this job from so many talented people who preceded me, as I have in every job, was a stock taking about, as you say, what's specific about this city and this museum and its history and its potential. What did you learn from the board? When you came in, you, you, you interview with the board. The board is evaluating mm -hmm. your, you as a candidate. You're evaluating this situation, seeing whether, whether you can make a contribution. What did you learn from the board? The board was eager to see the expanded facility, which was then almost finished, reach a community that had traditionally seen the art museum here as a privilege, place of privilege, a place of distinction, but also a, a place that perhaps wasn't as welcoming as had been hoped for. Privilege in the sense of well, you're privileged, you're not privileged, and yeah. this is our... Which clearly wasn't intended, but it's just often what happens with art museums, particularly when the focus is on building collections and building the internal capacity of a museum. And a large part of the expansion was intended to literally flatten the entrance, make it street level, and all of that preceding my arrival, very thoughtfully done. And what the board was looking for was plugging this building in and drawing energy from wherever one could find it to make the museum feel like a community asset, but equally a place of exploration and excitement. I always find it so admirable when a, when a board takes stock of, of the institution that they themselves have built and decide that it's time to deconstruct and rebuild and reinvent. Yeah. Was this part of your, uh, of the reason why this situation was attractive to you? This museum was attractive to me for a lot of reasons. There was the fact that it had a great tradition in education. It had a great tradition in collecting in depth in a very surgical way, whether it was the Pont Avant acquisition of 19th century material or the Edo material from Japan and the gifts of one form or another of collection, the Clues collection of Renaissance and Baroque art. And yet it wasn't well known. It wasn't heralded and celebrated as some other Midwestern museums, notably Chicago's Art Institute or Minneapolis or other museums were. So I felt there was excitement in trying to validate all of the work of the previous 120 some years with the resources that were available here, a strong endowment, a commitment from the individuals who built the museum and were still on the board or were patrons, and the small but intrepid corporate community. And I think there was also a real curiosity about returning to an encyclopedic museum uh, now as a director. I hadn't been in one since the Metropolitan. Toronto was, after all, built on the British model of Renaissance to today. So the opportunity to go to a museum that had Asian art and African art and ancient art pre-Columbian art, plugging all of that together and thinking about artworks as a story of humankind was very exciting. You've also struck out uh, into a new direction with the acquisition of the Miller House. Could you talk a little bit about the idea behind preserving this architectural gem? Well, a good friend of mine runs the historic royal palaces in, in the UK, and for him, he's preserving Henry VIII's castle in the Tower of London. So what do we have in this country that we can preserve? And it, until in the last four or five years, it has been the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So in the last few years, mid-century modern has become an arena for preservationists. And the timing of the Miller family's ultimate offering of the incredible estate in Columbus, Indiana, that Eero Saarinen and Dan Kiley and Alexander Girard collaborated to make one of the great domestic residences uh, in the mid-century. Having that offered here along with a handy and generous gift of five million dollars to endow it was something I worked towards with several members of the staff and with the board to make it a, a gift back to Indiana and to make Indiana remember that half, half a century ago it was a pioneering visionary place in design and architecture. Well that brings us back to the inception of the museum itself. Mm -hmm. Exactly and thinking about prospectively, how do we collect the 20th century? Because our collections are phenomenal right up until the end of the 19th century. 
And then we fall into the trap that many museums did in the 1890s when they were only collecting the past. They weren't thinking about the present. So we didn't collect as actively in the course of the first half of the 20th century. So what we're trying to do now is rebuild that but we can't do it through the unaffordable means of gold-framed pictures. We have to do it through design arts, through furniture and applied arts and design. And that's what we've been doing the last couple of years, is building a strong collection in design arts to walk back through the narrative of the 20th century. I've noticed you don't use the term decorative as much as design. Um, is, am I imagining something no, here? No, it's, it's very intentional. I, as a classical art historian, I looked at and still look at a Greek vase as an object of great value and virtue, practically and aesthetically. But to call it decorative would imply that it didn't have wine in it. And it did. And an Eames chair had somebody sitting in it. So I don't make a distinction in works of art between decorative and non-decorative. All art is in some way functional and all art is in some way decorative. But I think it's a submarining an artwork to reduce it to the level of decoration. You have done quite a bit in terms of, of, uh, of using electronic media. Um, you have um, a, a, a very robust um, program for uh, revealing information about the museum to the public. Uh, you make uh, tremendous use of video and the internet and and multimedia uh, productions. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your thoughts surrounding that and the relevance of, of, um, of a different type of experience to a museum, which traditionally has been a place you'd have to physically visit and, and walk through? And Well, there are a couple of billion people with cell phones today. Most of them will never come here. And there are billions of others in general who might today or in the next six years have internet access. So we could either define our audience as limited to the half million or so who cross our threshold every year, or we could ask, is what we're doing potentially interesting to anybody who can get online? And I think looking at both of those simultaneously is a healthy thing. If we can do something that's relevant to the life of somebody overseas as well as down the street, then I think maybe we are doing something more significant than if we're only focused on what a person walking in the door will experience. So somebody sitting in Beijing visiting the Indianapolis Museum for half an hour in the, uh, during their lunch break isn't out of the question. Well, it's, it happens. I wouldn't say half an hour. I think it's six minutes, but it's still <laughs> it's better than it used to be. And I think the provision through artbabble.org, which is a collective website we've built with a couple of dozen partner museums so far, to create a safe space for all sorts of museums to profile the activities that they're involved in. And artists. And yeah, and there are studio visits with artists, there are tours, there are inquiries of staff, and looking at common spaces on the web gets past the old-fashioned model of one book, one collection, one website at a time, which is ultimately, we're past that, I think. So now the museum as a building is, is, is part of a greater uh, picture. You are in the process collectively with, with board, the staff, other leaders throughout the field of redefining what a museum is. Yes, and we're presenting the United States Pavilion in Venice next summer with a technological twist that we're going to have a real-time experience of that in Venice so that people who live in our city and our state can have a, a capacity to experience it, maybe not exactly the way the hundreds of thousands of people were who go see the installation in the gardens in Venice, but it's important to us that whatever we're doing, wherever it is, if we're doing a park downtown or we're doing a project in Italy, that it has relevance locally and it has potential relevance internationally. So the connected world includes the world of art, the world of museums. It is a contemporary world. Thank you so much, Max Anderson, for spending time with us today and for providing your insights. Thanks very much, Mark. Pleasure. <laughs>